Uh, we are opening our new series called Love, Sex, and Dating today. And so if you have your Bibles, we'll be in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, as we conclude our series in the Chivalry Workshop, which we've been doing the past three, three Wednesdays or so, because we had a week break in between, we, wanna, we really want to look at, okay, what's going on with sexuality and dating and marriage in our culture in particular? Now, there was this, there was this thought that kind of permeated the end of the 19th century, that as we made more progress in the field of science and biochemistry and uh, molecular biology, that Je Jesus would be done with, right? God would be no more. This is what Stephen Hawkins postulated. Uh, this is what Richard Dawkins postulated. Well, here's the problem. As we're learning more and more about science and we're learning more and more about how, the way the world works, the opposite's happening. Almost overnight, with a guy named Alvin Plantinga in the field of philosophy, uh, the field has kind of become predominantly Christian in mindset. And because of different advances in cosmic microwave background radiation, which you talked about, the Problem of God series, the astrophysicist community has become predominantly Christian in a lot of those different arenas too. In fact, the only arena that really Christianity is a vast minority is in the humanities. It's when you look at the world and you go, well, then why is there so much evil in it? And there's a, there's a solution for that as well, but that's not for this series. But one of the things that fascinates me most about scripture is this. This book that's 3,500 years old, 2,000 years old, depending on what part of it you're reading, we're catching up to it. That, that blows my mind. We are, with all of our advancements in, in every single bit of what we know about the telescope and the microscope and everything in between, we're catching up to what the Bible says. Like, we're behind. So as we make these grand discoveries about certain things, you know, like, in particular, today we're going to talk about the brain's neuroplasticity. And you're like, that sounds boring. Trust me, it's not. Maybe it is for you. I shouldn't say trust me, because then you might go, you're a liar. But the idea is that your brain is moldable, it's shapeable, it's malleable, it's Play-Doh. It can be changed and, and addressed and, and, and morphed into something different. Your brain is not static. If it were a character in a show, it would be a dynamic character. It can, it, it has, it's got a mind of its own, you might say. But it takes on the very attributes that you give it. So you tell your brain how to think. Your brain is neuroplastic. Now, what's ironic is Scripture's been talking about this for thousands of years in the book of Romans chapter 12. The writer, Paul, says, now, here's what you need to do. To begin with, you need to begin by renewing your mind, okay? It says, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Then you'll be able to test what his will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. How? Out of the renewing of your mind, the transforming of your hearts. So the whole idea was this, is we're just starting to realize, we're going, Eureka, we discovered your brain is neuroplastic, and people are winning medals of science and, and brilliant genius level things and they're writing dissertations. And I think the Bible's sitting here going, wait, what? That's a 2,000 year old discovery, right? Every advancement, we're actually catching up to what scripture says. We're, we, we had this, we gave someone a, the friggin' Nobel Prize for dis discovering that air moved in cyclones and not in a single direction. And the scripture says, way back in the Old Testament, the book of Job, that air moves in cyclones. It's circular patterns. And so sometimes what, what flabbergasts me more than anything, what, what, when I say that, I mean what, what I think is really cool about scripture is that when we dive into it and we trust it in every aspect of our life, our life is better because God invented you. Why would we not give the one who invented you say in how you live things and live things out? And you go, but that book's archaic. My argument to you would be this. We have not seen in our generation or the generations before us a more sexually liberated society than the one that we live in right now. You can be what you want to be. You can claim to identify how you want to identify. You can sleep with whomever you want to sleep with. That, there's, there's literally no holds barred on it anymore. We, we would consider it to be sexual hedonism, which means hedonism means you do whatever your carnal flesh tells you to do in all, in all matters, okay? Freud would consider it the, it, the id of who you are the deep down part of you that's controlled by your midbrain or your snake brain. You can do whatever you want, whenever you want, with whomever you want, right? There's a few different rules based on age and things of that nature. But outside of that, it's kind of, it's kind of like Marcy's playground. It's kind of do whatever you want to do at all times. And, but here's what we're seeing. In research that is done by people, the people who are the most quote-unquote sexually free to express themselves however they want to, even to a point of, it, of overly expressing themselves, to a point where they would consider it an addiction, the lie that's been fed to us is the more sex you have, the more secure you're going to feel. If you want to be wanted, then wear this thing from Victoria's Secret. Then the guys will want you. And when they want you, they'll sleep with you. When, you, when they sleep with you, then, then you'll find your true worth. 
right? This is the lie we've been fed. Eat this, don't eat that. If you eat this candy for some reason sexually, is why do you have to eat the candy that way? But on the commercial, they're like, mm, indulge your senses, right? And, it's, and she's like a model. It's like, how do those things correlate? She's eating candy, and yet she is very fit, and things have been done to her to alter her body. Like, what, what are you trying to feed me? What's going to feed you a lie again? Which is, well, look, if you're having any kind of a trouble, if you eat this thing or you buy this thing, then people will want you. And we, that's like the pinnacle of what we think. Well, if I can just get people to want me, if I'm cute enough that people want me, if I'm popular enough that people want me, then I will, we always have an end goal in mind, which is satisfaction, identity, value, worth. This is what we're actually chasing, this worth, this knowing who I am and being proud of it and being okay with it. A group of people researched the group of people who would consider themselves the most sexually free, and here's the answers that they got from it. In a survey of the people who consider themselves so free to the point of they actually were a little bit... Um, they were so liberated by the sexual experience, they would actually consider it to be an addiction. We would look at these people, and if we keep believing these lies that the more sex you have, or if you're wanted by someone, or if a guy thinks that you're hot, especially enough to take everything off of you and to love you, whatever love you want to call it, we would think, well, if they're doing it more often, then they should have the highest levels of value, satisfaction, things of this nature. Conversely, those who aren't having sex in such a manner that is, that is completely hedonistic, but they're actually adhering to certain things and they're understanding biblical concepts, we would expect those people who are from the stone ages, right? Like, you're going to have sex with one man for the rest of your life? Good luck, prude, right? They are the least sexually, quote-unquote, liberated. Therefore, we'd expect them to have the lowest levels. And the 25-year-old guy in college who is the leader of the frat house that can get a new girl every night, we would expect him to have the highest level of satisfaction sexually because he's having it more often. He's having it novelly. That means it's not even, he has a new kind of person every day. And then he has to have more novelty and then he has to add new people to it and try new situations and have new risk factors involved in order to feel the same way he did before. The frat boys, those kind of people who are having sex more in an abundant hedonistic matter, they did a survey of those people and they asked them and they self-reported this in a survey done by a man named Carnes, who is not a Christian. No biblical principles were used in this, but here's what was reported. 97% of those responding said that their sexual activity led to a loss of self-esteem. 97%. Others reported emotional costs of strong feelings of guilt or shame to the 96th percentile. 94% said they felt isolated. Is isolated, is that weird? They felt isolated and lonely. But what? Wait a minute, someone lied to me, right? 94% of people who were having sex more than anybody else said that that sex made them feel lonely and isolated. Continuing. 91% said that they had feel feelings of extreme helplessness. 90% said while being in this addiction, it led to a breakdown of personal values and beliefs. 88% said they felt like they were two different people living in the same body. 83% said they had emotional exhaustion. 82% they had said they had fears about the future. Emotional instability and suicidal thoughts were to the 75th percentile. 42% of those uh, also had a problem with either alcohol or drug dependency. And 40% also had some kind of an eating disorder, whether it be bulimia, bulimia or anorexia or some kind of extreme body image deficiency to the point where it affected them physically. I think the lie's got to be exposed. This old adage of, if only someone wanted you in a carnal sexual way, then you would be, well, this study just says that's the exact opposite. We've been fed a bunch of BS. Now you're going like, well, you're a pastor, so you're all about abstaining from sex. Yes and no. For two reasons. One, yes is I don't have to pitch to you a biblical understanding of anything to tell you to abstain from sex. I can simply look at GQ magazine and the different studies that are done right here and tell you what the health of a, a truly healthy sexual appetite looks like. Don't compartmentalize me into someone who goes, well, you're just, you're just weak-minded, so you believe what the Bible says. I don't have to. Let's throw out the Bible and say common culture, people who study neurology, people who study the endocrine system, endocrinologists, what would you suggest, just based on your study, if you wanted someone, let's say you had a kid and you wanted them the, the, the best sex life possible, exciting, liberating, satisfying, uplifting, valuing, immersive, meaningful sex, that's what we want for our kids, right? 
Like, that's what you'd want for your kid. Not, not while they're kids. But, <laughs> but somewhere in the future, that's what you'd want. Given the choices, do you want to have reckless, meaningless, pointless, bombastic, uh, animalistic sex? Or do you want them to have meaningful, connecting sex? We go, well, I'd want that one. Well, then throw out the Bible, and here's what I would say. No biblical reference whatsoever. Here's what you should do. You should find someone of the opposite gender, commit to them for life, and sleep with only them after making some kind of a covenant to never leave them. You go, well, that's biblical. I, I actually didn't use the Bible for that. Studies would show that's actually the highest level of sexual satisfaction. The people in this room who are sitting here who are married have self-reported in a blind survey, meaning their spouses weren't sitting next to them, to have higher levels of sexual satisfaction than the 21-year-old who's sleeping with whomever they want to at the frat party. And the people who are sleeping with whomever they want to are developing neuroses, like isolation tendencies, uh, feelings of extreme helplessness, a loss of identity, breaking down their value system. So where I want to begin this series with is, why is this the case? Like if God is the author and perfecter of all good things, and he created you in your human mechanism, can we dive into a little bit of the, the inner workings of who you are, especially in dating, sex, and relationships, and go, look, you can cheat the system. You can have a great sex life, but it's not gonna be in the way that the world has told you. In fact, the way the world has told you is a blatant lie. And again, I've, I've, if, I've, if I've earned any chips with you on being too open or too honest or too vulnerable, I wanna cash all those chips in right now to tell you I'm not here giving some abstinence seminar as a Christian. Sex is bad, sex is, no, that's total BS. Sex belongs to the church. But we are so guffawed by the church talking about sex because since Victorian periods, sex is supposed to be this thing that's taboo and it shouldn't be. For us as Christians, it's what we were built from and what we are leading to. God initiated it, God designed it, God concocted the orgasm. He wasn't surprised by it, he is not ashamed of it. In fact, the, the wedding gift he gives every man and woman is the other person's body. It says that in the scripture. When I married Paige, his wedding gift to me was a naked version of Paige. I don't care what the frick your aunt got you for your wedding day, it's not as good as your naked spouse. It's the best, and there's an exploring, and there's an understanding, and there's a seeking, and there's there's a vulnerability that goes along with that. And God isn't shocked or freaked out by any of that. And yet we sit in churches when someone says sex and we go, that's not for you to talk about. That's inappropriate for church. What do you mean it's inappropriate for church? It was born in the church. It would be like if someone else was talking about baptism, we'd kind of be like, did you say baptism? That's a church word. Well, the other day I was in the river and I just baptized myself. It's like, you don't know what you're talking about. That should be how we should see sex. And someone goes, well, we were having sex. We should go, what do you know about sex? God made it, God invented it, God initiated it, and he also gave us plans on how to use it to satisfy us most. And the outside world has taken it, carnalized it, hedonized it, and said, this is what sex is. We should be looking at the outside world going, what do you know about sex? We should look inwardly at the church and go, this has got to be the place we can talk about sex. To not talk about sex because we're ashamed of it is to tell God, Mm, we've kind of quit on the whole sex thing. We've just given it to the outside society. I'm, I want to redeem it. It's his. So we have to stop blushing at the talk of sex, thinking that that's what our other people talk about, not what Christians talk about. That's totally bass backwards. It makes no sense whatsoever. It flies in the face of everything else we know to be true about the gospel and about God himself. He invented sex. He invented your endocrine system, but he invented it for a different reason. 21st century dating has taken the endocrine system that was supposed to be used to, to glue two people together for a lifelong marriage, and we have decided that we are going to take certain parts of that concoction and certain parts of that chemistry, and we're going to placate it for our own wants and desires, and for some reason it's not working, is it? So what we're going to do is we're going to take a headlong dive into the endocrine system today. You might not be excited about that. That's fine. You can sleep. I don't care. But I think it's going to help give a lot of understanding to the way that you and I work, especially in terms of love, sex, and dating. So as we begin this series, we can all have a foundational platform to use certain verbiage again and again throughout the series without having to explain it every single time. So 
This is what Helen Fisher, she's a, she has a doctorate. She's actually a pronounced atheist alongside of Richard Dawkins, who is one of her companions. And so they, they, none of this is coming from a biblical point of view. None of this is coming from a Christian scientist. So don't think like, well, that's really self-serving. No, she does not believe in God whatsoever. And so this is what she found though. She talks about in a book called Why We Love, kind of this four-stage process of, um, of attraction. She has three stages, but the Bible has four stages. We're going to use the biblical understanding, at least in the fourth stage. But the first three, we're going to take straight from her book. Important to know about this is when I say stages, it's not stages like stairs, like one has to lead to the other, and you need the one before it to predicate the one that you're on right now. That's not the case. They're basically three different lanes. Now, the healthiest situations kind of build one on top of the other, but it doesn't have to be, and, and we'll explain that more as we get going. So if you're taking notes, I would really encourage you to do so, even if it's on your smartphone or whatever it might be, because we're going to be talking through these things, the hormones that are involved with them, and how it actually transforms and molds your brain to think the way that you think today. In 21st century casual dating society, why everything is so broken, and what we can do to prevent ourselves from falling into the exact same trap. The first part of that process is called lust. Okay, the first part of that process is called lust. Lust, it, basically the culprit of lust is two hormones that are self-same responsible, which is estrogen and testosterone. Okay, obviously produced from the reproductive organs of both men and women. This is kind of the most carnal part of who you are when it comes to your sexual appetite. Okay, they did a survey and they put a guy in a room with a girl for four minutes, just under five minutes. And they found that in that room with that woman, even if he didn't find her attractive initially, that his testosterone boosted an average of 8% in the first five minutes. So this endocrine system, your hormones, without you even knowing it, were changing. What they noticed in his behavior is that he stood up straighter. His shoulders were arched back more. He used a deeper tone as he continued to talk to her. He used bigger flailing gestures to show power, to show domination. This, is, this was subconscious to him. This is the first step of what we know to be the attachment or the attraction process is lust, okay? Lust is a strictly self-serving hormone, okay? So when, when your body excretes testosterone, it doesn't ask questions like, what's good for them? What do they need in their life? What is healthy for them, right? It's, pornography is, is built in lust. It says, you'll do what you need to do to help me accomplish what I need to accomplish. It's strictly selfish, okay? Lust is a strictly selfish endeavor, as it were. So when you're walking by and some girl has a lot of stuff hanging out and you're watching her and you're like tripping into things, you're like, oh, she good looking, right? You're, you're, not, you're not asking questions like, I wonder what her dreams are. You're asking questions like, I wonder what she looks like naked, right? That's, the, that's what lust asks. It's all about me. Lust is all about me. Now, what happens when you begin to lust after someone is that there's a part of your brain called your prefrontal cortex and lust, your testosterone, your estrogen, basically, if it were a minion, the minion would like run up into your brain to your prefrontal cortex, which makes your decisions, and it switches that light switch off. So now your testosterone is like, I want her. And then your decision-making part of your brain that says probably shouldn't take your shirt off gets turned off. And so now this is where we find ourselves. We go, dude, you're making dumb decisions. And it's like, he can't stop it. In the middle of that pattern, he is kind of completely subjected and slave to his endocrine hormone system. So maybe you're walking down the hallway or uh, let's use the term of like a girl. If you're a girl and you're dancing like at your prom and it's like, girls just want to have fun and you're dancing like this because you just dance with your friend but then you see him and you see him moving from across the room and you're like, mm. And then your friends are all around you but then you start doing some like provocative junk like pop, lock and drop and you're doing some weird and your friends are like, what's going on? It's like, the reason that you're not aware of what you're doing, even though you look so dumb, is your estrogen has reached up and gone, turn off. And so you're like, you're like winking at him and you're like playing with your hair. And your friends are like, what are you doing? You're like, I don't know. I can't help it. I just look at my body. Look at my things. I didn't mean, I didn't mean things. I meant, I meant my accoutrement. I, my hands were in the wrong place when I said things. Stop it. I don't, I, guys, we're going to do a whole series called Love, Sex, and Dating I'm going to make more mistakes than that. I apologize. I didn't mean that. So this is why you might, some of my most cringeworthy moments as a human being are in the pursuit of someone that I was lusting after. You know what I'm talking about? Where in the moment you're like, this is a great idea. And afterwards you're like, did I really do that? Did I legitimately do that? Right? 
And it could be a number of different circumstances. But you find yourself doing really dumb junk. You know, like I used to wait outside the cafeteria and I would wait for Paige to come into the cafeteria and I'd pretend like I was just sitting there with my friends or whatever. And then, uh, the, guys, I'm not telling you this is a good thing to do. I'm telling you it's not a good thing to do. But when she would come up, I would like intentionally go and I would open the door. But I would pretend to not be talking to her. I'd pretend, like, it's just what I do. It's so natural to me that I'm just talking to my friends over here while I open the door for her. I don't even go in afterwards. I just shut the door behind her. Like, I'm just that level of etiquette. And that she was going to go like, oh, wow. Look at look how polite that guy is. I totally want to love him forever. Mm-hmm. But it was these, it's these little things that otherwise you would go, what am I doing, right? Maybe it leads you to get up and sing a song where you wouldn't normally sing a song. Or maybe it makes you say something you wouldn't normally say. But in the lust process, these different things are estrogen and testosterone. The next, the next stop in that process is... Uh, the attraction process. So if lust is estrogen and testosterone, it's, it's very carnally led. It switches off your light switch of what's a good decision. Then while your light switch is still switched off, you can move into attraction. Now again, they don't build on one another and they don't have to be with one another. Some of you know this. Some of you are really good friends with someone. And then all of a sudden one day you were like, bye, Jove, I think you're pretty. But you were never in like the, oh my gosh, phase at all. You went straight from like, oh yeah, and I, I developed a weird attraction for you, but it wasn't even born out of lust. So they're not, it's not one leads to the other necessarily speaking. Probably in, in, in most secular relationships, it is based primarily on lust, which then can move towards attraction, but it doesn't have to be that way. A girl that I dated for three years in high school, her name was Allie. We were really good friends and we, would, we had class together all the time, but we just related really well. We helped run the Bible club together at our school, which sounds, again, that's one of those things I go like, why do we call it the Bible club? But anyway, it was kind of a nerdy thing to call a Bible club, but it, I guess it was a Bible club. Anyway, one day I remember we always sat on the curb after school, like waiting to get picked up or waiting to walk home or whatever. And, and one day I walked out and I went like, oh, wait, I think I might be attracted to you. But I didn't have that lust like, you know, the coyote in the, the cartoon where like his jaw drops and his tongue like flails out and his heart's like, like that didn't happen to me. So again, don't think they have to build on one another. But the second phase is called attraction. Attractions, the main culprits in your endocrine system for attraction are threefold, adrenaline, dopamine, and serotonin. The attraction phase is what M. Scott Peck in the book, The Road Less Traveled, would call cathexis. So it's a fancy word to call, we would use the word obsession, okay? Which, before I was studying this stuff, I was like, well, obsession seems like a pretty strong word, but it's actually a very carefully chosen word, and we'll find that out here in a second. Adrenaline. In your attraction phase, where it goes beyond lust, now to like, oh, I think I like that person. Like, that's the verbiage we use now. It's like, no, I like them. Like, I'm attracted to them, Okay? The first part of that is adrenaline. Adrenaline triggers our, um, kind of like an emergency response system, okay? Which is funny because when we interact with someone that we find attractive, our emergency response system kicks into gear. Most people's emergency response to a situation isn't baroquial or romantic or pleasant or well thought out, right? Like if this building started on fire and your adrenaline kicked on your emergency response system, you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't have some quippy joke to tell. You wouldn't be polite. You'd be like, let's get the frick out of here now. And you would run and you would like punch people on your way. And <laughs> that's how you would act. Well, that's exactly what happens when you run across this person. When you become attracted to someone and you fall into this obsession state, then you, they're like walking by you on the hallway and like maybe you're just holding your books and just thinking about your day or maybe thinking about him. And then he walks like right beside you and you're like saying your name with his last name. You're like... Savannah Williams. I like that. Savannah Williams. And he's like, what'd you say? And then it's, it's, it's Trent Williams himself. And you're like, no, nothing. What? Why are you here? Where'd you come from? Want to see a cool trick? I can turn oxygen into carbon dioxide. <gasps> and then you finish and you're like, what's the first thing you do? You're like, stupid, stupid. What am I thinking? Right? It's like when you're in line for TSA, you're already kind of like, it's your cortisol system too, right? It's kind of your emergency response because there's all these people behind you, these people in front of you. And so under stress, here's what we do. We say really dumb things, right? Like you get up there, she's like, where's your passport? I'm like, oh, it's right here. And where's your, where's your identification? Oh, that's right here. She's like, okay, cool. Enjoy your flight. You too. Oh, you're not flying anywhere, are you? <laughs> then you turn around, you're like, hey, but listen, you're not flying anywhere. I know you know that, but you're, 
sir, please move on. I'm just, I want to make sure that you know that I know you're not flying or you work here, but you never fly anywhere. Maybe fly somewhere. I don't really know. And she's like, sir, please just leave. In fact, I revoke your ticket. Get out of the airport. So that stress is the same thing that happens when we bump into someone that we have an obsession with, which is why it generally doesn't go well. You ever notice that? Where like you have this, you're in the shower before and you're like thinking out what you're going to say next time you talk to him and it's like perfect. And there's like music in the background and stuff like that. And then you see him and you're like, what's, what's your, what's your favorite? What's my favorite what? But I love you. What? No. How many kids you want to have? Stop it. We fall victim to it. Okay. It's your adrenaline that kicks in. The next thing is your dopamine. Dopamine, which we talked about in the chivalry workshop, is your, it's your reward system of your brain. Okay, so when you're obsessed with someone, this kicks in. Well, this kicks in because it goes, well, if we want them to, I want them to like me. So, and they're possible to procreate with. So our brain rewards us for what we call micro victories. Our brain rewards us for micro victories in that relationship. Because if I've chosen to be obsessed with them, and, and I feel like I'm, we call it like falling in love, right? Because it seems like something we can't control. So if I'm obsessed with them, then my brain goes, well, if that's the person that we're married to, which this is what your brain thinks. Because again, with casual dating, we do everything backwards. In an ancient Near Eastern society, the first time you met someone generally was when you married them. So your brain is triggered to then be obsessed with them, which is really good when you're starting out a marriage together. But we do this when we first meet people, and when we're dating them, we go into obsession. This is why it doesn't end well a lot of the times. Because we haven't made a commitment or a covenant before to stay with them forever. So sometimes this breaks up our relationship because we go into like hyper freak out mode. Okay? So dopamine triggers that pathway. So we have micro victories that our brain gives us huge rewards for. Why? Because in marriage, what's, what's supposed to happen is that you're supposed to get huge amounts of dopamine for micro victories like she grazed my arm because this is our first day after we got married. This is awesome. So your brain's trying to reward you for that stuff to connect to that person. But you're not married to them. You're not even in a relationship with them and you're casually dating them, maybe. So your brain gives you micro victories for weird junk. Like, I remember the first time Paige ever sent me a Facebook message back. <laughs> and it was at Tito's bachelor party. I'll never forget where I am. I'm laying on the bed and we're sitting there, and it was, it was all the guys were in one room. We shared one big hotel room, and we were all sitting there. And it was like 11.30 at night, and I went, guys! And I like sat up, there like, what? And I'm like, she messaged me back. And the message literally said like, hey, sorry, I haven't gotten back to you. I'm really busy. I hope to, you know, write more when I have more time. And I'm sitting there like, play the wedding bells, play the wedding bells. And like, you couldn't have affected my mood right there. If you came in and you were like, Every dog you've ever known has died. And I would be like, whatever, she loves me. <laughs> we get micro victories, right? Uh, she, she, she asked me what time it was. It's like, so? No, you don't get it. It's how she asked me. For the general population, we go, I'm not quite sure that means a love connection. You're like, well, you don't know anything, right? <laughs> it's the way she did it, okay? So we participate in those micro victories. Uh, serotonin is the third part of the attraction process, which is the most absolutely fundamentally interesting chemical, I believe, in the whole attraction process. Serotonin, um, which most other chemicals, when you're obsessed with someone, they increase, but serotonin decreases. It's kind of hard to give this analogy, but this is the best way I've thought of so far, is your brain is like a, think of like a waffle, okay? And every one of the little pockets in your waffle is a different part of your life, okay? Now, waffle walls, those little, the, the, the sides on them are actually taller for guys, Guys, we have taller waffle walls, okay? Which means we're better at compartmentalizing stuff, right? I, I remember this conversation with Chris Brown one time. We're, I was sitting in his office. We probably talked for like two hours straight about things. We were laughing. We we're talking about fishing and junk like that. And then I'm about to walk out, of the, I walk out of his office and I go, oh, I forgot why I came in the first place. My grandma died on Thursday. And he went, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah. What? I, why didn't you bring it up? Because we were talking about fishing. What do you mean, why didn't I bring it up? We, we weren't talking about grandmas and whether or not they were alive. We were talking about fishing, like that, you know? Or you guys ever like grow up and you had a friend on your block that you played with every day and then one day your mom was like, what's his name? And you're like, I don't know. <laughs> his name is Kid in the Yellow House. Like, it, you guys played together for 37 hours this week. I, I don't know. It's, it didn't come up. It just wasn't a thing. We compartmentalize those things. Or <laughs> my wife's always like, so what'd you do today? Well, we went golfing. 
you went golfing, so you were in a car with him for like six hours. How's his family doing? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? And I'm like, we were golfing. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't like, hey, nice putt. By the way, how's your family? Right? It just didn't come up. We compartmentalize things. Women tend to be more of a chicken pot pie mentality where it's like carrots, peas, gravy, all stir that junk around into one big pot of thought, right? So one thing tends to influence everything else, right? Like I'll talk to, I'll be like, hey, how you doing? And she'll be like, fine. And I'm like, what's your deal? She's like, last night I had a dream that my boyfriend cheated on me. <laughs> and why are you being snarky to me? Your pastor, like, why are you, oh, you don't understand. And I'm like, you're right, I don't understand. Your waffle walls are so tiny. You have, you have miniature waffle walls. Yours like a mini waffle, okay? And everything just influences everything else. Now, what serotonin is, is serotonin is the chemical in our body that when it's necessary, it allows us to get over those walls into the next wall. Think of it as almost like a syrup. That if you had syrup in your waffle pit and then it would go up and you could swim from one to the next, high levels of serotonin allows us to make connections, right? Like if I date this person after having almost dated her friend, and then I start dating her, that's going to lead to really bad things. But when you're obsessed, your serotonin drops. Your serotonin decreases. So your ability to make conscious decisions based on all of your relationships and all of your emotions goes bye-bye. So you are stuck with much higher waffle walls that don't communicate with one another. So when you go like, why are you asking her out? You were just dating her friend. You're like, why does that matter? And everyone else is going, what do you mean, why does it matter? Of course it matters. But with your low serotonin, because you're obsessed, you just go, I don't get it. Why would that be an issue? What do you mean, why don't you? This is the understanding of obsession. Low serotonin. The other people group that has historically and always low serotonin levels are people who are diagnosed with OCD. So your brain takes on the exact same, which we didn't talk about before with dopamine, they did scans of people who consider themselves in love or obsessed in the cathexis stage. Their brain scans in an MRI were exactly the same as people who were addicted to cocaine. Now, you, you have to understand how important that is. You can't just let that fall on deaf ears. That means that when we are obsessed with somebody, our decision-making to get more of that person or to get more of that attention is exactly the same as the decision process, decision making process that a cocaine addict, addict makes to get a, the next fix. And we know what people who are addicted to drugs will do to get their next fix. They don't really make a lot of sense to us. Whether they're turning tricks, they're prostituting themselves, they're stealing things, we go, why are you doing these things? You don't understand, it's for my next fix. This is how your brain works in obsession. But you're hurting your family, you've rejected all your friends, you're not even going to church anymore, that was so important to you, why have you done this? You don't get it, it's for my next fix cocaine, addiction, and relationship obsession show up on the brain scan in the exact same way. This is how important it is to make sure we've got mentorship in our life. Now, with serotonin, what serotonin will do is it shows up in the same way that obsessive compulsive disorder shows up. So when you say you're obsessed with someone, it literally, in the dsm 4 we would say that low levels of serotonin allows someone who has OCD to not understand the connections that are made throughout the world, right? So Mark Clark, one of the guys I love studying, he's a pastor up in Canada, and he used to get on planes, but he had to tap like each of the overhead bins seven times so the plane wouldn't crash. Does that make sense? No, it makes sense to nobody but him because in his high waffle wall, low serotonin brain, if he tapped this, it would prevent the plane from crashing. You might have the same thing in your life. The reason that you have it is because your syrup in your waffle holes is too low. It, does, it isn't able to see things and go, wait, do I really think that tapping this is going to prevent our plane from going down? So for those of us who don't have obsessive compulsive disorder, we go, you look crazy. But in their reality, with that low serotonin, they're not choosing to be crazy. And it's actually not crazy. It's just low serotonin. That's all it is. So the, the brain scan of someone obsessed likens itself to an obsessive compulsive disorder and a cocaine addict. We gotta make sure we understand those things. Lastly, is attachment. Attachment. So we have lust, then we have the second one, attraction, then we have attachment. I was thinking what I was gonna say next, I forgot what that word was. Attraction, then attachment. Attachment, the main chemicals responsible for attachment are oxytocin and, and vasopressin. 
oxytocin and vasopressin, okay? Doesn't matter how you spell it as long as you can read it. Oxy unless you want to look it up later, in which case you probably know how to spell it. Uh, but you can ask someone else. Oxytocin and vasopressin. Oxytocin is the, is the cuddle chemical, as it's affectionately known. Okay, the cuddle chemical. And the cuddle chemical is what happens three times in the life of a human being. We experience oxytocin three different times, if we're lucky. If we're lucky or our life goes that way, the three times that we experience high levels of oxytocin are in orgasm, when we are breastfeeding from our mothers, and during the birthing process for you females. Now, those are pretty what we would consider to be monumental moments, right? Like you don't give birth every day. You don't breastfeed a new baby every single day. And well, I don't know about the third part of it. We don't need to talk about that too extensively. But I'm trying to liken it to understand the same chemical cocktail that God made for a woman to connect to her baby who's gonna be screaming for the next three months when she's trying to sleep, but still permits her to go, whatever, it's my baby. Whatever, it's my baby. Whatever, it's my baby. That's oxytocin. It stops your brain from going, Get rid of that thing. It keeps whining. It's, shh, you're so whiny sometimes. Now, sometimes that actually happens where oxytocin is blocked, and that's where you get this kind of rejection of the parent from the parent of the kid. But in, in a healthy brain, that system is there, and it unites them almost for life in breastfeeding and the birthing process. And the third part, the third time that oxytocin is released is in orgasm. So we can't be sitting here going, I'm having casual sex. Your endocrine system is what's considered value neutral, which means it doesn't know if the sex that you're having is productive or destructive. It doesn't know that what you're connecting to is productive or destructive. It just knows, it says, whatever you're doing right now, we're gonna connect to it because your brain was meant to have sex with who you're supposed to be married to. So when God invented that cocktail, it was, I want you to connect to them forever. So I'm gonna throw the whole kitchen sink at it. You connect whatever's happening right now. So if you go, well, I just wanna have sex with this guy. I don't really know his name. It's kind of a reckless environment. I'm not really thinking clearly. I'm a drunken mess, but I really just want it so I can feel good about myself and have a fun night out. Your brain doesn't, doesn't sit there and go, we probably shouldn't connect to this situation. Your brain, your endocrine system is value neutral, which means it throws the kitchen sink to connect to that process, whether you want it to or not which means the next time your friends want to go out and, ha and get drunk, even though the, the night after that happened with you, you were like, I'm never sleeping with anyone else again. I feel terrible about myself. I compromise my values. That's not who I am. The next time your friends invite you to go out, what do you say? Yes. You want to know why? Because your brain, you've just trained it that that's what we connect to. You're not seeking then to go have a meaningful relationship, to procreate at some point, to have someone who your parents are going to be proud of. You just want the reckless, meaningless sex because you've told your brain that's what marriage is for you. The beautiful part about the neuroplasticity of your brain is that your brain can be redeemed. That if you're sitting in here and you go, well, I've had a lot of sex, your brain is malleable, which means it can go back to the way that it was. And for those of you who are like, well, I, don't, I haven't really had it, know how close you are to that system. We have to be careful, but we also have to understand the love of a God who made our brain changeable. Imagine if there was no redemptive value in the human nature. Imagine if, oh, you've had sex with someone recklessly. Sorry, you are destined to a life of reckless, meaningless sex. No, God in Romans chapter 12 says that your brain can be transformed. Your mind can be renewed. So, attachment, oxytocin and vasopressin. Vasopressin literally is what controls our thirst. It's, it's basically the last hormone to be introduced when we choose to be with someone. We release a chemical called vasopressin. It takes away, it's, it's, it's what they liken to your actual thirst, like our needing to be quenched with water. Vasopressin is what's released when we are, have been satisfied with the amount of water that we have, so we don't want any more. Vasopressin in a relationship says, even though there's a lot of other girls out there, there's a lot of other guys out there, my thirst for other people has greatly diminished. Vasopressin does that for us. This is the endocrinology of sex based on strictly secular terms. We as Christians and those who believe in scripture and the outside world in general wants a part in it, even though they don't sometimes understand what it means, our last step in this process is what we call love, which is not found in any of those other systems. Lust is not love. Attraction is not love. Attachment is not love. Love stands alone. Why does it stand alone? Why does the Bible talk about love so much and lust very little? And what I mean by lust, I don't mean by here's what lust is. It doesn't call us to lust. 
It doesn't call us to be obsessed with people. It doesn't call us to be attached to people. Why doesn't it tell us to do that? Because you'll do it anyway. You don't need help with it. So why does the Bible talk about love so much? Because it's the opposite. It's not natural. There is no endocrinology. There is no understanding for why someone who's been married for 15 years still gets up and does the dishes for their spouse, even though it's not their job. There's nothing in the brain that you can scan and go, well, it was for their own benefit right there. That's why they did it. There's nothing that can scan and figure that out. There's nothing that naturally leads us to love one another. That is why Christ has called us to do so. That's why John 13 says, they're gonna know you're Christians by the way that you love one another. Now, by the way you lust after one another, that's everyone. Or the way that you are attracted or obsessed, that's everyone. The way you can attach people, who cares? I care that when your brain tells you you have no more reason to invest in this person, take care of this person, be generous to this person, you go above and beyond and you do it anyway. This is what Christian love is all about. Love begins where effortlessness ends. Effort kicks in where our endocrinology stops. No one has ever instructed me on how to be lustful. I don't need help. My endocrine system tells me how. It tells me how to obsess over things. It tells me how to attach to things even in an unhealthy way. It does not tell me how to do that against my nature. This is where Christ steps in and he goes, if you're gonna be bigger, if you're gonna be, if you want sex that's worthwhile, if you wanna be a good lover someday, understand this. Love is the key to satisfying sex. The way that God invented sex is the key to satisfying sex. Of course it is. He made it. But, but sex is like fire in our culture. God says, look, here's what, here's what you do with fire. You put it contained. You put it inside of a fireplace. Here's the different chemicals that you can use. Here's the different fuels you can use. Here's how close to stand to it. Here's when you ought to build it. Here's when you shouldn't build it. And that fire can do a lot of things. It can feed you, just like vasopressin. It can literally satisfy you because you can cook things on it. It can warm you. It can give you all the feelings and emotions that oxytocin can do. That's what fire can do. Fire can also be preventative. You ever heard like a burn line you can use? If you have a controlled fire, you can make sure that fires don't happen in the future. Sex can do all these things. But our common culture of secular sex is to say this, take that fire outside of its context, it's gonna burn your house down. We've said, well, if fire's good in a fireplace, then isn't fire good everywhere? Like if sex is good in the confines of marriage, can we take sex outside of marriage and it's just as good? The answer is no. We sit here and we try to have sex with whomever, whenever we want to, outside of his boundaries and our house is collapsing on us and we're going, maybe the answer is more fire. The answer of the sexual addicts who are in this survey, 97% of those who said they have a low self-esteem, the answer to the lack of meaningfulness they find in sex is almost always what? More sex. I'm not coming to you as a pastor here pleading because God really hates sex. God invented sex. He instituted it and he gave it to us. I'm coming as someone who, as a pastor, as a husband, wants you to grow up and be great lovers in your marriages. I want you to have a great sex life. You're like, you're not supposed to say that in church. I don't care. They can fire me if they need to. You want to have a great sex life. I want you to have a great sex life. Why do we talk about pornographers? pornography so much in here? Because it kills your sex life. Why are we talking about casual dating and the toil, to, toll it can take on you? Because it can ruin your sex life. It can ruin your marriage. I don't give a rip if you're a great dater. I care very much if you're a great husband or you're a great wife. And if we don't start retraining our brain right now, we cannot wait till we get married to go, and day one, you're too late. Your brain's already been trained to want meaningless, reckless, casual encounters. But if you want to be more than that, if you want to be someone who, you, you don't love, you don't have sex with 40 women in one year, but you have sex with one woman for the next 40 years. And you're, you mean something. You're purposeful. You're intentional. You are going to report the highest level of satisfaction more than anyone else in your culture because you went completely against what was natural and you chose love and you chose this archaic, old, antiquated book that shockingly was written by the one who invented sex. And he says, I didn't write this to have you abstain from any joy. I wrote it so that you could have life and have it to the full, John 10, 10 says. That includes sex. So we need to retrain our brains to want what is best for us and not what is simple and easy. We need to give up what we want now for what we want most. We have to starve what we want now to be satisfied with what we want most. Let's pray. 
God, as we begin this series, Love, Sex, and Dating, we love the fact that you're not a God that's mute on these topics. If, they're, if they are the base of what it means to be joy-filled in this life and to, be, to have a meaningful existence, we love that you're not a God who says, figure that one out, that these pages of scripture are marked and scarred all over the place with people who have done sex correctly and have bad sex, have done marriage well and have not done marriage well, and you've allowed us to learn from their mistakes, but you've also given us a guideline to say, I made sex. I invented it how I want you to use it, and the way that you use it, in my terms, will satisfy you the most. And God, if, if we've kind of strayed away from that, we also know that Romans 8 says there's no condemnation for us. We're not supposed to sit here with guilt or shame, but instead that can all be redeemed as we move towards your plan for our sexuality and our future marriages. We love you. Let me pray. Amen.